This is Danny and Gallant on 710 ESPN Seattle. Streaming nationwide on the 710 Sports app and 710sports.com. Now here are your hosts, Danny O'Neill and Paul Gallant. Time to put on the show. show, show, show. It is Danny and Gallant. It's Tuesday, which means we've not only got Brock Heward under center, we've got Brock Heward in studio for Blue 42. Here we go. This is Coors Light's Blue 42. We're going to go red, right, tight, close, sprint left, G, U corner, half back, flat, on two, ready, right. Blue 42 is brought to you by Coors Light. The mountains turn blue at 42 degrees. Blue 42. Now here's your hosts, Danny O'Neill and Paul Gallant. Blue 42. Blue 42. Set up. <laughs> Morning, Brock. How are you? Good morning, Danny. I got breaking news for you. I just What's shared with, uh, with Jessamine before I walked in here. I, I'm going to wear her most difficult hat. I'm going to be a sideline analyst this weekend in the XFL. Oh, let's go. Yeah. Brock and I both in Houston this weekend yeah. for various reasons. That's exactly right. So, yeah, I don't know who or how many guys said no until they finally called someone to say yes on Saturday. So, I will get to do the inaugural Houston LA Wildcats game in Houston Saturday on Fox. I've got one question. This isn't question one. Are you going to talk to Clayton about using a fanny pack? Possibly. Yeah, possibly. An XFL fanny pack. <laughs> That'd be great. Re- really, really strong. Probably get it uh, with some glitter and, yeah, all, all just. Yeah, bedazzled. I'll, I'll, yeah, I can do that for you. Oh. Just I've got a hot glue gun. Do you really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Just bedazzle that sucker. <laughs> bling, bling, bling. All right, here we go. Question one. What does Patrick Mahomes bring to the table that Russell does not, Brock? Yeah, I was listening to you guys driving in, and I think you, both of you guys were spot on. It's just the size. It's being six foot three, 230. But I will say this. Blessings can also be curses. And he took a beating in that Super Bowl. He did. Uh, For two years, he's been a starter. This year, he actually missed games with that dislocated kneecap, came back, fought through it the year before. I believe he had an ankle injury, a toe injury, a lower body injury that he had also kind of battled through, and he did, and he didn't miss any games. Sometimes you think you're big and you're powerful and you're invincible until you're not, and you start to take a beating. And that would be my biggest concern as you kind of look at Russell and Mahomes. And if, like, this day you say, yep, Mahomes is a step ahead of him, well, Russell's got an eight-year track record of being unbelievably meticulous in taking care of himself. I mean, it is it, – it, when, when you are around him on a day-to-day basis in season, it is scary, the maniacal nature that he goes about taking care of himself so he can be available every single day. And I think that will be the challenge for a very young, gifted Patrick Mahomes. That's where they're different. Mahomes got the advantage with some size and strength. I think Russell's got the advantage of an unbelievable discipline on a daily basis to do everything imaginable to be available. We'll see if Mahomes could do the same. Is it possible that Russ's size lends itself to maybe being a little bit more able to withstand the hits? Yes. Oh, I don't think there's any question, man. He is so strong. Now, Mahomes is also strong. I mean, Mahomes, you saw he took some violent hits. <laughs> he had uh, Jimmy Ward knock Jimmy Ward out of the game uh, by bouncing off of him. I'll be curious in five years or in ten years if there's not a little more Ben Rump to Patrick Mahomes, mm. right? If he gets to 240, if he gets to 245, if he's just a, a big old dude back there that realizes, yeah, I'm not going to just be scrambling around and, and stiff-arming dudes and, and having guys run into me, but I'm going to be a big man in that pocket that those guys just cannot bring down. I mean, he had a play earlier where he scrambled and there were two 49ers that hit him. Out of 32 starting quarterbacks, 30 of them go down, but he's able to kind of fight through. It almost propelled him into like a 10-yard scramble. That's a big, strong man. It's an interesting decision for Mahomes going forward because I think he's incredibly cat-like for a quarterback. Now, he's not hes not Kyler Murray, and he's not quite Russell Wilson either, right. but I, I do think that there is a nimbleness to the way that he runs around, and if he were to bulk up, maybe that wouldn't be the case. There is, but there's also, when Russell was 24, his quickness and speed were a notch above what Mahomes is. Right. right? Mahomes just does it at 6'3", 230. I think that's where he's m- more unique. But we know in time, you are going to add some weight. In time, you are going to get beat up in this league. And in time, he's going to have to have that razor-sharp discipline that Russell has shown for eight years that I do think sets him apart. Question two. Seahawks dealing with a lot of injuries this offseason. Which one to you 
is the most intriguing and challenging? Chris Carson. Justin Britt's ACL, you, you know how that goes. Michael Kendrick's ACL, you know how that goes. Those guys have already, I think, had surgery and on the road to recovery. We saw this with Leno Hill last year, and we saw it really limit him the entire offseason. He was a non-participant in OTAs and minicamps, and he was literally and figuratively a step behind this season with that hip injury. Seahawks seem to think it doesn't need surgery. Uh, but anytime you have an injury like that, you don't want to go in. They don't need to go in and have surgery. I think that's a positive. But at the same time, there's a massive amount of unknown. And that's a guy that likes to train. That's a guy that loves to take care of himself, who has really accentuated his body and his physique in his time here in Seattle. And, you know, what what and how does that progress? Uh, he, he's a big part of what they were. You saw that without him. I mean, he yeah. was a gigantic part of just defining their personality, of, of accentuating their scheme. And, and, you know, he's a guy that wants his. He, he's going to want to get paid here soon, as all young running backs do. And so just kind of monitoring that, watching that with so much unknown, without a surgery, you know, with, with a rehab that is going to be kind of difficult to define, with a player itching to get back out there, with a significant enough hip injury that A, knocks him out of the season, and B, probably three or four months of very little activity. That's one I'll be watching closely. Brock, you mentioned his desire to get paid. Yeah. I don't think there's any doubt. He's eligible for an extension. He's a seventh-round pick. He's going to want an extension. He is a big part of what Seattle does. Do you extend him? I don't think you can extend him this offseason, Dan, just because of those unknowns. I think you want to see him go about it and get it done again and just say, hey, I know you would like some. Now, is there an opportunity to get a favorable deal? A Marco Gonzalez... Yep. Right, Evan White. So, from a player perspective, he wants to get paid. I don't think the team has any desire to pay him seven, eight, nine million bucks, wherever he thinks or his agent thinks he would rank as a top five rusher in this league. But all of a sudden, is there a chance to get some millions of dollars and say, okay, we'll, we'll get you a three year extension, but it's going to be on our number. And that number may be five or six million bucks in generational wealth for you, but certainly not market value to what your agent is, is spewing your way. So, that would be the only scenario, but even there, Danny, he's been injured all three years, basically, of his career. He's been a guy that's been unable to be consistent over the entirety of his football career, high school, junior college, college, and even these three years. So I'd be a bit apprehensive to sign him that check. Brock, it's interesting you talk about the injury history and sort of extending guys. So what Seattle's been best at yep. is guys coming off of their rookie deals extending those contracts because that's a point where you do have a little bit of leverage you can get a little bit of value but the thing is you have to be right you're making a decision on that guy's future a year before you have to i think what i think one of the most remarkable things that john schneider's done is that he has not missed on the, in those cases mm -hmm. when he's extended a guy out in front when he's got one year left on his rookie deal he has nailed it every single would time. you say though danny you did not do that with frank clark right they chose yeah they chose not to chose not to with a fetty chose not to with frank clark uh, yep. I, I, you know, frank got his 20 million i bet you a fetty's gonna get paid somewhere yes he not is here in seattle it's not gonna be here it, no and and he's gonna get paid elsewhere so yeah uh, when they made that choice they have been right and nearly spot on they've also over the last couple years not made that choice on a couple guys and uh, those guys have gotten paid handsomely elsewhere Question three. Brock, at age 28, how much better can James Garoppolo get? We've decided we're going to call him James instead of James. James Richard, right, Lydia? James Richard Garoppolo. James Richard? <laughs> well, I, I heard you guys talking about that on the drive-in, that he did not have a defining moment. I think they would argue the New, or New Orleans Saints toe-to-toe -to -toe with Drew Brees in a game that meant an awful lot. Right. He threw like a five-yard pass to George Kittle, and Kittle ran down the field with a guy hanging off his face mask. He, Jimmy didn't do anything. Yeah, did. didn't he throw for like 400 yards that day, he though? He threw for a lot of yards. He did have a 75-yard touchdown pass. It was not the best 75-yard touchdown okay. pass. It involved a little bit of tangling and trippage. But yes. that was right when they were down 20-7, to 7, an immediate answer to a Saints touchdown. But if you're pro Jimmy, you're going to look at that and say that was a game off of a, a difficult Baltimore loss where they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ravens on the road. They had to win. Right, It was that, that gauntlet of, of Seattle and Baltimore and in New Green Orleans, Bay. one of the most difficult places to play in New Orleans. You had to go get a win, and Drew Brees went crazy, and your defense got gashed in ways it did not get gashed all season long. 
and he had to respond and did. And yes, George Kittle made the the defining play at the end, breaking the tackle. But you know, he was still the guy to get that done. If you're a Forty Nine er fan or you're Forty Nine er brass and you believe in Jimmy Garoppolo, that's the game you point to and say that was a meaningful game. That was end of season. You don't win that game, you're not the number one seed. The playoffs going through San Francisco and ultimately getting to that Super Bowl. If you're on the other side of it, which I think you two are, which I would probably be a little bit closer to, you look at that fourth quarter and say, man, there was not one chance. There was not two chances. There were three really big plays where you you just want to stare them in the eye and say, hey, man, this is a Super Bowl. And you can't go three for seven, 30 yards in the fourth quarter and miss third down after third down after third down. That little shot of Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch was right on his back uh, shoulder on that third down t- uh, post route to Mosley. They've been sitting on that. Um, excuse me, to Emmanuel Sanders. They've been sitting on that play, right? You're waiting for that moment. Okay, we're between the 40s. We're going to expect to get this bracket coverage. You get everything you wanted. That's why Shanahan was like backpedaling as that play was going. Former receiver, sees the game through a quarterback's eyes. He knows what he's going to get and just put air on that ball. You just, you just yacked that one, man. You, you did grip that tight, and you just did not let it go and give your guy a chance to go finish the deal for you. So that fourth quarter, very, very concerning, Danny. And I don't know if it's quite sour milk. I don't know if you use that comparison or analogy with quarterbacks like you do kickers. Once it goes sour in a big moment like that, you are going to be apprehensive until he proves in that big moment he can indeed get it done. What's he best at? Because it does feel like the 49ers Looking work good. around him mm-hmm. more than they work through him. I would say he, if you were to go watch him throw, Paul, if you were to join your 7-on-7 seven seven team, and I know with your wrist injury, you're probably not catching his, right. his, his, his any of his passes right now. Yeah, it's going to be tough tonight playing with this. Yes, but if you were if you were to come out, you go, wow, this guy can really throw the ball, like consistently, really throw the ball. Um, and so when he's clean and the pocket is clean, he's mechanically clean, uh, he's got, I wouldn't say a plus arm, but he's right there at league average, if not a little bit more. And he's pretty good fundamentally. Um, I, I think those are all areas of some strength. Whenever, though, things break down and when there's ever pressure on him, either the pressure of the moment or certainly people in his face, throwing the ball to the perimeter is the biggest step. to a Long-winded answer, Danny, to answer, can he get better at 28? He's got to get better in those pressure moments, and he's got to get better pushing the ball outside those numbers. Those would be the two huge areas of improvement that he's got to take. Brock, how do you know when one player is absolutely going after another player's neck? Ooh. Ooh. The answer is when they mention their salary. Frank Clark to Fox Sports' Peter Schrager, quote, you paying the guy $140 million, $130 million, whatever he's getting paid, man, he's got to throw the ball. <laughs> Obviously, he didn't do that. They threw for about 200 yards on checkdowns. That ain't enough to win a game against us, end <laughs> quote. I thought Chris Myers had one of the sneaky good lines in the Super Bowl when he was interviewing Frank and the Honey Badger. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and Frank is going on and on and on. And Chris Myers like, well, we got to get this guy his own show, you know. And then he turns to, <laughs> <laughs> to Honey Badger. Uh, yeah, Frank, Frank's not afraid of that microphone. No, his world tour is just beginning. It's apparently it started, yeah. Yeah. Apparently, he's getting his. He wants his Super Bowl ring sized for his middle yeah, finger. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, beauty. All, all, all the haters out there is like, yeah, all the haters that traded a first and a second round pick and paid you twenty million dollars. Like, I'm not sure if you're. I still not remember sure if you're being disrespected. <laughs> sitting in the studio like a year ago, and G Scott was in for one of his Wednesday mornings, and uh, we were talking about Frank. He's like, you know who Frank is? You can't pay Frank. Frank's your crazy uncle that comes to the party. Like, you don't give your crazy uncle just all that dough because the crazy uncle's already crazy, and then he could just go off the rocker, which we may see with Mr. Clark this offseason. Brock, it's always fun to talk to you. We appreciate you stopping by. We look forward to talking to you on Tuesday. Yeah, we'll do it. On Thursday. We'll do it on Thursday, and thanks to Toyota Pion for making it all happen. See you, boys.